for killing Hannah brought to justice. A wealth of forensic evidence was found on both Hannah's body and her clothes. Her bloodied coat contained a full DNA profile of Coley, but he wasn't on the national DNA database, so the police didn't yet know he was the killer. What they did know was Hannah had been abducted by an Asian man in a diesel van. And by cross-referencing CCTV with Hannah's mobile phone location, they narrowed their hunt down to seven possible vehicles. With that information, they made a nationwide appeal. Mr Coley's employer uh, rang in uh, and put Mr Coley's name forward. Mr Coley was a delivery driver for uh, a firm that delivered sandwiches and other foodstuffs uh, in the Southampton and Portsmouth area. Now, what he was also able to give us as his employer was the registration number of the van that he was using. And hey presto, Coley's van turns out to be one of those seven that had been highlighted. Coley's van had been filmed at every key location on CCTV. We get Hannah making the treble nine call um, on the Friday night at 11 o'clock in, in the northern end of Southampton, going towards the M27 from Portswood. We look at CCTV, sure enough, the van used by Coley's on that. And it's quite a distinctive van, because if you look there, there's some sign writing on the side of the van, but also there's a, a refrigeration unit um, on top of the van. Um, and that was part of the noise, actually, you could hear on the um, treble nine call. There was also footage of Coley traveling past a Texaco garage, close to where Hannah's body was found. There are three sightings at this location at um, different times of the night. Um, Coley is going one way, um, and then he's going another way, and then he's coming back towards Allington Lane on the last occasion, timed at 3.15 in the morning. We look at CCTV, our theory was right, it's southbound on the M275 into Portsmouth. So the coincidences start to run out for him, you know. The icing on the cake then is when we come to the South Sea area. It's here that Hannah's mobile phone stopped moving and once again Coley's van is caught on camera. And in actual fact it was an area that he wasn't due to go to, so that was quite a significant bit of CCTV. We straight away went down to his, his employer at the time uh, and sealed off the premises. We seized the van that Coley used and um, as a result of examination of that van we found evidence of uh, Hannah's blood as well as DNA evidence which puts Hannah in that vehicle and Coley. Inside Coley's van police found Hannah's hair along with her blood on a chrome pole. Coley's semen was also on the vehicle's seat. This matched the DNA profile found on Hannah's jacket. The evidence was, was mounting up against him uh, and, and it was clear that you know, we felt that he was our man. The forensic evidence, the phone evidence, the CCTV evidence, everywhere that we could possibly look to test things, Mr Coley's name was, was cropping up and there does come a time when you, you, you say this is beyond coincidence. 13 days after Hannah was abducted, raped and murdered, police knew who their man was. Maninda Pal Singh Coley. They went to his house to arrest him. We had a good look around. It was completely empty. You could see that from the, door, uh, from the windows. There was nothing inside, no curtains, no furniture. It was just completely empty. Coley's wife, Shalinda, was tracked to her nearby parents' house. She explained that her husband had rushed to India to see his sick mother. Uh, she was very gravely ill in the Punjab, and Coley wanted to go and see her because he was really worried that she was going to pass away before he saw her. Four days after killing Hannah, Coley had gone on the run which this CCTV footage from Heathrow Airport confirmed. Coley had boarded a flight to Delhi. His mother um, was in a coma. She'd been hit by a bus um, some months before. 
But when Kohli arrived in Chandigarh, it was a, a big surprise to his father. He didn't know he was coming. He got himself a, a little place in a flat just around the corner where he lived for five or six days. But he, he didn't really do anything. He didn't go out. He was very, very... Neighbours said he was seen to just stick himself indoors. He, he didn't mix with anybody. Um, he just spent most of his time at his mother's. But for Coley, this wasn't a mercy mission to visit his dying mother. He was only interested in escaping British justice. Within days, word got through to his brother, Ishpreet, that Hampshire police were trying to arrest Coley. Ishpreet was a local police officer and in denial about Coley's guilt. But Coley was not about to use his return ticket to the UK. Instead, he cut his hair, shaved his beard and carried on running. It shows you the character and the personality of this man. They couldn't put his hands up, turn himself in, come back to England and fight to prove that he did not kill Anna Foster. He only thought one person, that was himself. Back in the UK, Coley's wife then made a startling admission. She told me that when Coley went to the pub, he went in his van, his works van. That's the only vehicle they had. When he came back, he was really, really upset. She told me that he had a scratch on his face. And she told me that he had told her that while he was in the pub, somebody, he doesn't know who, had opened his van up and put a body in it. So when he came out, he'd found this body and he'd driven home uh, with the body in the back of the van. Um, Shalinda was adamant that she hadn't seen the body, she'd had nothing to do with the van, and she said, if after all, after he told us that, um, he was very, very upset and they fell asleep. And after a couple of hours of sleep, he got up and went. Like the rest of Coley's family, his wife refused to believe he was guilty. As far as she was concerned, we had the wrong person and we needed to be putting our investigation somewhere else and concentrating our efforts somewhere else. Shalinda was arrested but later released without charge. And then Southampton detectives did concentrate their efforts somewhere else. They focused on the Herculean task of trying to find one man in a country of over a billion. India is a, is a vast country with a, with a vast population and on the face of it, it was the proverbial needle and haystack. Maninda Pal Singh Kohli was on the verge of disappearing. Forever. The horrific abduction, rape and murder of Southampton teenager Hannah Foster had made this man, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli, the UK's most wanted. Days after murdering Hannah, he fled to India. On his tail were detectives from Southampton. One of the biggest frustrations was we couldn't go to the Punjab. The Ministry of External Affairs would not allow us on that first visit to go to the Punjab, which is where we needed to be. We needed to speak to the family, we needed to, to gather the evidence of his last sightings. The Indian police at the time were saying he killed himself. That was their theory for the first six weeks. He's probably dead in the river uh, and topped himself and would never find the body. But I, the way he, he's a coward and he wouldn't have done it. The thing is, in India, this type of murder happens every single day. So when we told them about Hannah, they were concerned. You know, they, they could understand why we were there, but they've still got all the investigations they've got to do as well, haven't they? So she didn't take a priority. There's 1.2 billion people there. It's a huge, huge area. They've got vast amounts of crime themselves to deal with. You can understand them trying to solve their own crimes first before they look for one that was perpetrated 4,000 miles away.
the Punjab police, I don't think, would have moved their little finger to do anything uh, in this particular case because it was not their headache. It was not their problem. It had happened in Britain. Red tape, bureaucracy, and a lack of available manpower had given Kohli a crucial head start. Although we weren't totally losing hope, we, we were beginning to wonder, you know, are we ever going to get a, a successful resolution to this? We didn't even know if he was, if he was still alive. He, you know, he disappeared away from his family in India um, to where we didn't know. Kohli was now 600 miles away, close to the border with Nepal in the West Bengal city of Darjeeling. I met him as a tourist. He was in my taxi, you know. He told me, like, he was a delivery driver, like, in, back home in London. So he had his family down up there. So he told me he had just come for vacation. He was known as Mike, actually. Mike. And I, I just remember Mike only because he never gave his second name to me. So we used to call him, I used to call him Mike. Despite now having a new name, Mike Dennis, and a new identity, Coley never felt truly safe. The newspaper used to come around over 8 o'clock. It comes late in Darjeeling. He used to go for the headlines and just turn the pages all the way. Within five minutes, the newspaper is finished. You know? He always used to tell me, even if I die here, you just inform the police, he'll be loaded, you know. I just used to find it as a joke all the time. Six hundred miles away, the Indian police had finally allowed their colleagues from Hampshire access to the Punjab. The best guess at the time was that he was in the Punjab because he had family to look after him. In any family, you know, there is that commitment to your children, to your, fa you know, to your brother, sister. Um, how else was Coley surviving? We often wondered how he was supporting himself, and um, it is still a bit of a mystery as to how he did support himself. But, like he did in this country, he used other people, and I believe he may have used other people in India to support himself, um, in particular his, his family. But Coley's father insisted he was not sheltering his son. I say if he has committed crime, hang him. I will be the last person to protect him. If he has done this crime, he should be punished and he should face the music. He should face the consequences as per law. I will not uh, uh, protect. And if he is innocent, God will protect him. Hampshire police still had no idea where Coley was, but they were sure someone did, and together with the son, they came up with a plan to flush him out. Along with Hampshire police, we put up a substantial reward of five million rupees, which is the equivalent of 70,000 pounds. In a country like India, that's like a lottery win. There had to be a substantial amount for the Asian community to realize how serious um, what Coley had done was and how important it was for the British police to capture him. After laying low, Coley was back on the run, this time to the small town of Kalimpong. He joined a Red Cross group and the Red Cross group was based in, in Kalimpong involved with uh, vaccination of the local inhabitants there. He told the uh, Red Cross Society guys that he, uh, he was from uh, World Health Organization as a member. So everybody used to think that like, he's a doctor and even my auntie could call him like doctor, doctor. That's why he came very close to you know, the locals very quickly. It just shows him basically almost in a, in a Jekyll and Hyde light. Um, there's this obviously evil and vicious raping murderer that he is but then just as easily he can just just switch he can be the aid worker um, looking after sick helpless ill people um, he can just change his persona you know just like with the click of the fingers it 